Good morning. This is a tree. For today, this is a tree. All right, we are talking about uh, Jesus and uh, his seven signs that he is the Messiah. So we've been walking through this for a few weeks. Uh, we are on to a new sign that Jesus gave uh, to directly tell everyone, and that was understandable that he is the Messiah. He was the promised one to come. Uh, now, we are in uh, Matthew today. Uh, we've been walking through John, and uh, last week we covered Jesus feeding the 5,000, and that miracle is actually listed in all of the four Gospels. See, the Bible's broken up into two sections. There's an Old Testament, okay, which is the story of God creating the world, choosing a people, promising that a Messiah would come. There's 39 books there, and then, boom, that Messiah comes. Uh, we believe that he has come. He is here. Uh, uh, he, he was here, gave his life for us, and he, he's uh, gone to be at the right hand of the Father. So uh, that's Jesus. So once he entered, that's where we start the new law, the new covenant, the New Testament. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John are the first four books in the New Testament. There's 27 books in the New Testament. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are eyewitness accounts or firsthand surveys of the life of Jesus. So uh, the feeding of the 5,000 is in all of those. Now, the same evening that Jesus fed 5,000 with five loaves and two fish, now, we know that it was much more than 5,000, but uh, 5,000 men is what we have account for. That same evening, this happens. There's a much more detailed account in Matthew chapter 14 than there is in the book of John. So I'm reading to you out of Matthew chapter 14, okay? So go there with me in your Bibles or all the scripture will be on the screen. If you don't have a Bible, we have them in the foyer and would love to give that to you. Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. Here we go. Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. If you want to take notes, there's a note card in front of you. Feel free to write that down. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. You know what? Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you would just take away distractions in, in this place. And uh, God, don't let me be a distraction. Forgive me my sins and, and speak through me. Forgive us and, and, and let us hear from you, Lord. And uh, let this not be in vain that we meet today, but let us receive your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. This is Jesus dismissing the crowds that ate Okay, these are the 5,000 that ate, and he dismisses the crowd. He tells the disciples to get into a boat without him and go to the other side of the sea. After dismissing the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. If you walk through uh, the Gospels, you will notice that Jesus gets alone to pray very often. Okay? Uh, and if you want a better relationship with Christ yourself, this is something that you also need to mimic. He will live sinless, and yes, he was God, but he was also fully human. He knew all the, all the temptation, and he had all of the things that you have, uh, but he never gave in to those. And you say, well, how in the world could he do that? Well, look at how he lived his life. He positioned himself. I'm going to call it he worked against himself. So if you're not working against yourself, you're not improving. We're, we could probably all go, I need to pray more, right? I need to pray more. I need to pray more. What's the problem? Not maybe necessarily motivation, but time. You're not going to pray more if you don't have time to pray. And you are waiting for there to be 24 hours and five minutes in a day so that you'll have five minutes alone with God to pray. And it will never happen. Therefore, you're going to have to work against yourself. You're going to have to give up something. You're going to have to rearrange something, right? If you want to go uh, on a diet, 
you're going to have to deny impulses. You're going to have to work against yourself. If you want to get stronger, if you want to get healthier, if you want to get more godly, you've got to work against yourself. Jesus is working against himself in that fashion all the time, okay? So read through, see what he does, mimic that. Verse 24, meanwhile the boat was already some distance from the land, battered by the waves because the wind was against them. So we have got a strong wind and it is creating strong waves. We call that a storm, okay? So this particular instance is in three of the four of the Gospels. And some say there's a strong wind, and in some instances we get there was a storm. But this is not a good time to be on the sea. They're not crank-starting their Evinrude here, okay? They've got paddles. They're rowing against the wind. They're going against the storm. Verse 25, Jesus came toward them walking on the sea very early in the morning. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said. And they cried out in fear. Do you understand what that means? They cried out in fear. <laughs> they did exactly what you would have done. They screamed. <laughs> this, I just think this is so funny. You've got 12 men in a boat in the middle of the storm, and they're just screaming. I mean, you, you know, there's, put yourself in this situation, though. There, they haven't watched Bruce Almighty, there's no CGI. You, you know what I'm saying? They've never seen somebody do anything that can't actually happen. We are so dulled. We are so, our, our senses are so muted. Uh, you, you can watch all these superhero movies and all these things, and you see people do things that are uh, phenomenal. They, they cannot be done. We're, we're sort of numb to some things. But this was not CGI. This is actually happening. There has to be an explanation. Someone is walking on the sea, you know? So they literally scream in fear. Now, the storm is against them. Jesus comes walking on the water. They scream. And if you read Mark's gospel, he says the reason that they, they, the reason they did this, the reason they screamed, the reason they're taken by surprise is because they had already forgotten the miracle of the loaves. Same day, earlier that day, they kept walking back up to Jesus getting more food. More food. They knew there was only five loaves of bread and two fish, and they would distribute it. They would walk back up to Jesus, get food, walk back down the mountain, hand it out to people over and over and over, and they did this all day long. You know how long it would have taken to do 10, 15,000 people? Just as much bread and fish as I can carry and coming back, as much bread and fish as I can carry and come back. You know how long that would have taken? This is what they did all day. Miracles all day. And now... They're completely taken by surprise. Now remember, this is a sign. This is, I, I believe, the fifth sign that Jesus gives the people to say that he is the Messiah, the one that was to come. And so as you're, as you're reading this, well, what part of this is a sign? Is it that Jesus was walking on water? Is that the sign? And maybe, uh, see, these people had the Old Testament, not in the way that you do, okay? You have one book that has 66 books in it. You're actually holding a library when you hold your Bible. Uh, they would have had different scroll, scrolls at different places, but they would have memorized much of this. And one thing that they would have memorized, which is probably the first book ever written in the Bible, I'm not saying it's the first to happen, it would have been the first to have written was out of Job. Job chapter 9, verse 8, uh, in, in a in a in an explanation about God, it says, He alone stretches out the heaven and treads on the waves of the sea. So maybe they're thinking about Job here uh, because they would have known the story very well, would have, would have memorized much of it, okay? Or maybe it is that they are waiting for a Messiah who will be like Moses. And so Moses is going to uh, put his staff into the Red Sea, and the Red Sea will part, and the people will go through the sea. And they're like, wow. And so here's Jesus. He didn't even have to part it. He's just going to walk on top of the water. And maybe this is what makes Jesus like Moses. There are other water references that we could go to that I don't want to reference because maybe you haven't read the Old Testament. But maybe walking on the sea is part of 
what makes him the Messiah. And I'm not saying it is, but I'm going to say this. It means something. Right? It means something. I mean, can you look through your life and say, you know, here are the parts where I have given myself to the Lord. Here is where I followed the teachings of Jesus. And here's what happened as a result of that. Here's what happens when I don't follow Jesus. And so when naysayers come or people come to cast doubt into your life, you may not know exactly what happened, but can we say this? It meant something. Something happened, right? There was something going on. All right. Matthew chapter 14, verse 27. Immediately, Jesus spoke to them, have courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Now, the New Testament will be written in the Greek language. So you know how it is. I mean, we live in Texas, so everybody has a little bit of experience with translating, right? I mean, we, we, at some point, you've had to translate something into Spanish, or someone who is a first language Spanish speaker talking to an English, or first language English talking to Spanish, and everything doesn't, like, it's, it's the same thing, but it doesn't come out the same, right? Okay? So, uh, this happens in the Greek language, and so when we translate these things, which all of your Bibles, I, I think, I don't know of any version that you would have in here right now that didn't go back to the original Greek. So I, I, know, I know somebody told you at some point that everybody just copied the King James, and that is crazy, not true. That is so not true. Uh, they, they all go back to the original language and then translate it for you into your modern language. But it says, have courage, it is I. I say all that to say this. That's not how he said this in his original language. He said, have courage, I am. Because in the Old Testament, Moses was told to go and do this miraculous thing, all these crazy things, and he said, who will I tell them told me? And he's asking God his name. And God says, in our language, I am. That's who you will say sent me. And so Jesus says, fear not, I am. Didn't you see all the miraculous things that I did in the Old Testament, I'm doing them now. I am, I am. Jesus is telling them here that he is the Messiah, okay? And then he says, do not fear because I am. Now remember, they're in a storm. Jesus has to command them. If you read back through this, Jesus commands them to get into the boat and go to the other side. Now, keep in mind that most of these guys are fishermen. If you are a fisherman and you are worth your salt, then you are not only a fisherman, but you are also a meteorologist, right? Because if I'm going to get out on open water in a rowboat, first I'm going to look, right? I'm going to see what the weather is like. So probably the reason he has to command them to get into the boat is because they're like, hey, that's, that's not a great idea right now. I know you're God and all, but I've fished for a while now. <laughs> Those aren't good clouds. We need to stay off the water. But they get on there. They're in a storm. They're struggling. Okay, the wind is against them. And God says, get in. He walks up to him and says, do not fear. We talk about this all the time. When you're reading the scripture, there's gold there for you. There's, there is there, there are things of value there for you to take and to put into your lives, okay? Now, don't try to make it about yourself. Most of the time, it's just about God because a better understanding of God will make a better you. But understand that this is some gold on the ground. This is a huge nugget of gold that's right here on the ground. When God is in your storm, do not fear. God sent them into a storm. The presence of the storm doesn't mean that you're out of the will of God. Does that make sense? Now, that, I, I can't just throw that in a blanket sweep statement over everyone. If sin got you into the storm, then obviously it wasn't the will of God. But if you're following the Lord and you find yourself in a storm, do not fear because he's with you. How do I know he's with me? He's telling us this right now. And, and keep this in mind. Jesus isn't walking on your pool. This is not calm water. 
Jesus is probably drenched head to toe with salt water because the waves are big. I mean, the, 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 it's a storm on open water, unfazed. Just going to walk right over the top of it. Do y'all lose sleep over that? Like, if there's big waves, how do you walk over the water? I don't understand. And if there's a current, do you have to walk twice as fast? None of this makes sense to me. Are y'all with me on this? I don't understand how this happens. That's the whole point, is it's not possible. How many things... Has God brought you through that wasn't possible? How many of us have fallen at the job site just to have rebar sticking up between you and go, oh, wow, I was an inch away from being impaled? How many many of you should be dead? I don't want to hear the stories. (laughs) Jesus is walking over the storm. I know that you are in a storm, but he is walking over your storm. He is not concerned with the storm. He sent you into the storm. And when he is with you, do not fear. Because here's the harsh reality, parents. Watch Jesus' parent right here. He is the best Watch him parent. He sent them into a storm. So in the late 80s, early 90s in Arizona, uh, a massive project was done. And we created a biodome. And when I say we, I had nothing to do with it. We're just going to call it America, okay? A massive biodome was created, and I believe biodome number two covered like over three acres. It is massive. But one thing that they noticed, and, and it will eventually, the entire biodome will fail. Maybe one day I'll tell you all the reasons it failed, because it's very interesting. But one of the things that they noticed would happen is trees would only get so tall, and then they would just fall over. And this was baffling the scientists in biodome number two. Why were the trees falling over? Well, after a lot of thought and study, they realized that the one thing that biodome number two did not have was wind. And because the trees never had to fight against the wind... They never grew strong enough to sustain a large tree. God, why would you? Trust me, you'll see. And so we look at this and we're like, Jesus, come on, man. Dude, you're, you're like 32 at this point. You know how to watch the weather. You knew what you were sending them into. You knew they were going to treat me like that. You knew this was going to happen. You knew that this was a a terrible boss the whole time. You knew that this was going to happen to my spouse. You knew that this was going to happen to my health. Why would you send me into this? Because if you didn't have it, you'd die later. That's not easy to say because y'all been through some, some stuff. Did you not hear the testimony? See, I know this person. You don't know, who, you don't know whose testimony that was. I do. I know some of those nasty stories. And that was, that was tough. I, I, you know, you, you're like, oh, oh bless, her, bless her heart. She made it out of it. Alive. I, this got serious. The stories can be pretty rough. But God understands that without the wind, you won't develop what we call stress wood. Isn't that awesome? So if these trees don't create this stress wood, they're just going to fall over. Their roots are not going to 
grow properly. I'm not going to try to get into it because it gets way over my head, but without the stress. And this is why Jesus doesn't take us out of every storm. He's just with us in the storm. Because something miraculous is going to happen here. Matthew 14, 28. Lord, if it's you, Peter answered him. Anytime you see Peter talking, you're just like, oh, this is going to get good. (laughs) Command me to come to you on the water. Verse 29, he said, come. And climbing out of the boat, Peter started walking on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the strength of the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. I don't think I can tell you exactly why Peter gets this idea. I've heard a lot of speculation. Remember this. Stop putting yourself into the Bible. Now, if if you want to say, hey, I would have wanted to get out of the boat, and here's the reason why. That's fine. But let's let's not contribute your thoughts, wishes, and desires onto Peter. We don't know exactly why he gets out of the boat, but he does. And why does he start sinking? I've heard this taught on many times, and, and I've heard quite a few people say because Peter began to doubt himself. Let me tell you another thing about interpreting Scripture. When at all possible, take the natural reading of the text. Okay? So is it possible that Peter begins to doubt himself? Yeah, sure, but... What's Peter got to do with walking on the water? You know what I'm saying? I don't care how much Peter believes in himself. Peter can't walk on the water. Peter can only walk on the water. And and I'm going to propose this to you. If the other 11 men would have gotten out of the boat, they would have sank. Why? Because Jesus never told them to come out on the water. And so the rule of physics still applies to them. They could not have faith that they would stand on the water because they had no command to stand on the water. So you can't have faith in a command that wasn't given, right? Now they could have asked, but you guys can go out and you can muster up all the faith that you want and and step out onto your pool or step out onto the lake and you're just going to get wet. Unless, of course, you hear the command. Can that happen? Yes. Will I believe your story? Right after I check your medicine cabinet. (laughs) So just a joke. You know, the interesting thing about this whole wind and tree thing is, you know, obviously they have to have some sort of opposition. Something has to work against them. They're going to have to do hard things, just like you. You're going to have to do hard things. In fact, I propose this question to you right now. What are you doing that's hard? If you're not doing anything hard, you're wasting an opportunity. And I've been asking myself the same question, so worry not. I'm under the same conviction you are. But we're under training. But the problem is, without wind, the trees can't grow. They'll never reach full maturation anyways. But if the wind is too strong, will the same thing not happen? Have you never seen a storm take down a tree? And so truly, we need God... (laughs) To send us wind and then to save us from the same wind. Right? I mean, there is not, there is not a moment that you don't need God. God, nothing's going on right now. Help me. God, too much is going on right now. Help me. I've gotten bored. I've gotten spiritual lazy. Help me. God, you've given me too much. I mean, we, we need him on, on both sides of this coin. I think, that, I think that going back to Peter, Peter begins to sink because the Bible says he begins to look at the storm. He begins to look at the waves. And so when I, when I stop and I say, Jesus is walking on the water, how does this happen? Because you understand that a wave doesn't just have a peak, it also has a trough. 
One is below the water level and one is above the water level. How does this happen? And Peter sees this coming and he's like, well, what am I supposed to do when this comes? Do I jump? Do I dive through it? Is it just going to like disappear around me? If this is hard enough for me to walk on, is that then going to be hard enough to knock me down? What is happening in this miracle? And he started to look at the waves and he got distracted. For what reason? Can't tell you what was going on in Peter's mind. Here's all I can do. I can reflect on my own heart and what's going on in my life now. What is distracting me from my Messiah now? What is distracting you from what God wants to do in your life right now? It has nothing to do with how awesome Peter is. Peter was a phenomenal guy. I can't wait to meet him someday. He did incredible things. He will later, uh, you know, uh, the Bible doesn't tell us, but history, and this was written like 300 years after Peter died, so maybe it's true, maybe it's not, but we do, we are pretty certain that Peter will be crucified like his Messiah, uh, but secular history will tell us, well, it's actually old church history, it's just not canon, it's not Bible, will tell us that he says, I am not worthy to die like my Savior, and he will actually be crucified upside down. So Peter is a phenomenal person, but Peter's not good enough to walk on water. The point in the story is the glory of God, not the glory of Peter is that Peter is going to do something incredible because God is incredible. So if you are trying to be incredible, <laughs> just focus on the Lord because you're going to let yourself down. Okay? You're going to let yourself down. And if you view me in that light, I will let you down. And if you have a spouse and you put them on that kind of pedestal, they will let you down. Focus on Jesus. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. For who makes you so superior? What do you have that you didn't receive? If, in fact, you did receive it, why do you boast as if you hadn't received it? <laughs> it has nothing to do with how awesome we are. It has everything to do with Christ. I can't, I can't stand to see arrogance over something that we possess. For example, if you're fast and you can beat everyone in a race, I'm sure that you've had to work a little bit for that, but also you have a God-given talent. <laughs> and you need to use that for His glory because that was given to you. It's cool to have, man, work on it, hone it, but don't be arrogant about it. You really didn't do much for that. Does that make sense? We could extrapolate that into so many areas, but focus on Christ. I, I, when I was a youth pastor, I had a young man that would, would visit our youth group on occasion, and uh, kind of an entertaining, wild guy, and he decided one day it'd be a great idea to, uh, to just go to a different town, bust out a bunch of windows, and take things out of those cars. And so I went to visit him behind bars. And I told him, I, was, I said, man, you have obviously a boldness. You've perverted it. But, but you're a very charming young man. You've got all of these things going for you. And, and the Bible says, he who is faithful with little, much will be given. But to whom much is given, much is required. I said, so God is requiring more out of you. You're not going to be given more unless you, begin to, unless you begin to be faithful with what you've been given. And so stop perverting this. Stop using it for yourself. Use it for the Lord. So later that guy, he bails out of jail. And I, one of the first visits he makes is to me. And he comes back to me and he's pen and paper. And he said, tell me again that scripture that you told me where I'm destined for greatness. His eyes were in the mirror. Well, I didn't say you're destined for greatness. I said, God is great and He wants more from you. But we are so focused on our part in this that we just forget to worship God. 
We look at this whole miraculous thing and we think about Peter and how can I be like Peter? And it really doesn't have a lot to do with that. If you look at John's gospel, he doesn't even mention Peter walked on the water. It's just Jesus. It doesn't matter who else Jesus allows to walk on the water. He's controlling the water. He's controlling physics. He's walking over our storm. They are exhausted after their day. They are not happy with where they are. If their boat capsizes from these waves, they are far too far away from shore to swim back. They may die tonight, and he's going to walk over the very thing that might kill them. That's the point. Peter walks on it. Yeah, that's kind of the point, but man, that's like a secondary point. But even the point in that is that Jesus will allow you to walk through the storm with him if you will focus on him. We're trying so hard to be like Peter that we forget who Christ is. Verse 31. Immediately Jesus reached out his hand, caught hold of him, and said to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those in the boat worshipped him and said, truly, you are the Son of God. This is interesting. You of little faith. If you're you're in the the year of our Lord, 1611, in the King James in here, ye of little faith. Ye are you. Often, Jesus says this. You have little faith. You have little faith. You have little faith. I did not exhaust you of little faith. So I could, be, I could be wrong on this. So I will, I will use almost instead of always. But I think, I think that almost every time Jesus says, you have little faith, he's going to perform the miracle anyways. Think about that for a moment. Because I hear this, and I hear, you have little faith, and I'm like, oh, you blew it, Peter. You could have walked on water the rest of your life. You just didn't have enough faith. And it's not what he's saying. He says, you have little faith. And I think what he's doing is commenting on the material that he had to work with more than saying, I can't do it unless your faith is big enough. How do I know that? Because he did it. He took a man with little faith, and strolled that dude across, across, across a sea. Think about that for a moment. He still did it. Go, go do a study on this. I'm interested, and, 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 and it may be wrong, but I think every time he says you have little faith, he does the miracle anyways. What's the point? Jesus uses people of little faith. See, we've always read this thinking, he can't do it because my faith isn't big enough. That's putting the focus on us. See? The focus on Jesus, who can do it despite of our little faith. So, take heart. So God uses people with a little faith. Do you have faith as large as a mustard seed, then you can say to this amount, move and it'll be moved. What is he telling you? I can use you. What have you got? I just, a little bitty, little bitty. I can use that. Let's go. Jump in. Do it. Afraid or not, let's go. So here's maybe the sign. If you notice in this passage, uh, the wind stopped. The sea stops churning. He's calming the storm. He'll do it again in another miracle that will be listed later. But Jesus takes Peter, pulls him back up. They get into the boat. The storm stops, and immediately they find themselves at shore. I think this may be why they're testifying that you are the Messiah because the wind ceased. So if you, if you remember in the beginning of the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the deep. 
if you read that in its original language, this was chaos. It was chaotic waters. Uh, what do you, what do you, what do you, Dusty, Dusty knows this. Wild and waste, I think, is our most direct translation of this. It was, it was wild and waste. It was unruly. And the Spirit of God hovers over and he begins to bark things into order. And he takes chaos and he makes order out of it. And Jesus comes in and he takes this chaotic storm and he's going to make calm out of it. He's going to make order out of it. The same thing will happen if, if you've ever heard about Jonah being thrown in, into uh, the sea and swallowed by a whale. There was a massive storm. And they're going to calm down once he comes, right? Right? They're going to see Jesus fix this storm, and they're going to worship him. Now, question, just to end. Worship team, go ahead and come up. Have you acknowledged Jesus in your storm? Is he's there. Don't look for him under the waves. (laughs) Don't look for him necessarily in your boat. He is over your storm. He has complete control of it. And until they bring him into the boat with them, the storm doesn't stop. Will you bring him into the boat with you? But you don't understand, I'm not one of these super religious, I'm not very spiritual. No, but you are in a storm. And if you have faith like a mustard seed, if you can be, if it can be said of you, you have little faith, then that means at least you have a little faith and you are qualified to meet the Savior in your storm. Next time you'll have a little more faith, right? And this is how Jesus will bring you to a place where you can hit full maturity without falling over. He's just waiting on us to cry out, to call him. So I want to invite you to do that. You're already winning this morning. Man, it's spring break and you guys are in church, so I am so proud of you. But I just want to pray with you. If you want to to just kind of be in your own bubble and looking at Jesus and, and you're just looking at the feet of Jesus and talking to him, that's awesome. If you want to look at me, dude, that's fine too. But I just want to pray for you. God, I know that there are a lot of storms in this place. I know that uh, we are so focused on ourselves right now. Lord, it's hard. It's hard to see anything else uh, but ourselves when we're hurting so much. But God, I pray that uh, we'll do like Peter did and stop looking at the waves and start looking at you, Lord. Uh, Lord, we have proven over and over that we cannot row against these waves, that the storm is too much for us. And you have proven over and over that you are above the storm. And God, I pray that you will come into the boat with us, Lord. God, I pray that your saints will go home and they will hit their knees and, and pray to you and that we will open our Bibles and read your word, Lord, and that we will, we will commune with, uh, with the church, Father, that we will just praise you, that we will worship in spirit and truth. God, I pray that we will work against ourselves, not just for self-betterment, but to make more of you in our lives. Church, I just challenge you, work against yourself this week. Can you do something to make more time to meet with Christ so that you can tell him about your storm, acknowledge to him the season that you're in and invite him into the boat. He has healing for you. He has calmer waters for you. And we ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Worship team is going to play a song and baskets are going to come to the front. And so uh, part of the way we worship is with our tithe and offering. But also, if you will fill out your connection card, uh, place it in there. Let us know what you're walking through, what we can pray about with you. Uh, please put that in there as well. Uh, stand and worship with us.